we looked at because last week was canceled because of the revival services. So just to remind you, the first message we looked at of the 13 messages was listen to your parents. Second message was say no. Third message was don't reject wisdom. Uh, fourth message was to seek wisdom. Fifth message was the characteristics of wisdom. Sixth message was wisdom uh, that wisdom is a family treasure to cling on to it. Uh, seventh message was to choose life. Eighth message was that sin is very enticing. And ninth message was that uh, to be faithful to your spouse. Which brings us to the tenth message today. Any questions about Proverbs so far before we get going? No? Okay. If you do, just cough very loudly. Clear your throat. <laughs> Sit there and stare at me. Um, eat a snack. Don't eat a snack. <laughs> Looks like you all have questions. <laughs> um, so the tenth message is in 6, verses 1 through 19. Uh, really the first half of the um, chapter. And the eleventh message will finish up chapter 6 and go through chapter 7 as well. Um, so how we'll do this is I'll read and we'll kind of just do it as we go along. And why is this going all at once? Let me fix that, guys. <laughs> Not supposed to do that. You know what it is, I think? I think that it's – I did it on my desktop. Oh. And I think that that caused it to uh, think that it had a mind of its own. Ah. Bad computer, bad. And when I had to replace this, the uh, the other one just ran on my other one because it was cracked so bad. Uh huh. It starts going off by itself. You mean ringing? Or turning off? <laughs> turning itself off and on. Oh. on. Just click, click, click on a whole bunch of stuff, apps and stuff, and just doing it over and over again. Sorry about that, guys. Mm -hmm. Let's try this round two. Aha! Okay. So um, the tenth message in... In, in short version is... Uh, These are all in Proverbs, right? Right. Um, right. Uh, I, sh I forgot that you missed the uh, the first lesson. We're going through Proverbs ch verse by verse, um, and the first uh, section of Proverbs was like chapters 1 through, I think, 9, if I remember correctly. And it's basically 13 messages um, between a father and mother and, and, the, and the child or children. And so that's like the first like nine chapters, I think. Let me check. Yeah, that's the first nine chapters. Um, and so we looked at the at, – uh, we've been looking at about three messages a night. Tonight we're only looking at two though. Um, so the, the, the tenth message is basically avoid debt, laziness, and deceit, which all kind of kind of go go together. Debt is owing someone or being being you know indebted, um, bound to somebody. Uh, laziness is usually the reason for debt, <laughs> and deceit is usually something that you do <laughs> when you are dead <laughs> or and lazy. So, anyways, uh, the first thing is uh, the first five verses here. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are ensnared in the words of your mouth caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So the first thing uh, that this that this uh, that this message teaches is that promises <clears throat> excuse me, promises are a debt. Sorry. Promises. I am having a hard time focusing, guys. Ever? Did you ever have those times when your head just feels real foggy? Mm -hmm. I'm having that right now. Um, I have no idea what this is talking. What what this is? So I'll just <laughs> simplify it. Um, promises are are a trap. When you when you indebt yourself to something, it's it's a trap. Uh, yeah. Boy, I, I bet my original wording was fantastic. But anyways, uh, just the just the, the the language that he uses here. Does anybody want coffee? No. 
So, so the idea here, you know, the, the, just the image that it builds up here gives your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. That, that idea of urgency to get out of this uh, because it is a trap. Uh, it's a trap! If you're familiar with Star Wars. Uh, then in uh, verses 6 through 11, go to the Anto sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Uh, throughout this pa passage here, he compares it uh, to the work of an ant. Now, pay attention to what he says here. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Basically, he's talking about the way that you know laborers oftentimes will have like a manager or someone back in the day with whips to drive them on. Right. But <laughs> the, the ant, not so much. Uh, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Um, so there's a few things uh, to, to note. Uh, I'll just read the note first off, and then I'll come back to this. Be diligent, work hard, and do what needs to be done. Without without people writing you just because it's the right thing to do. You know, Take care of what needs to be done. But if you if you look at what he says here, um, but after he after he, he starts with this... Um, Ant analogy it ends in verse eight. She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her fruit in harvest. You know, doing the things in the season that it's time for, so that she'll have for the time that there is no food. You know, summers ants gather in summer because they can't gather in winter. But then on verse nine, he kind of says something pretty interesting. How long will you lie there, a sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? So it's not that the sluggard isn't handling their time well; it's that they're not handling. Anything. Well, the ant is doing it in, in season, right. whereas the sluggard is like, eh. whatever, and isn't doing anything. Um, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest is this idea that just a little bit of rest. You know, I, I'll just, I'll just ease back just a little bit. And this actually applies more than just than in labor. We do this spiritually too, right? Mm -hmm. I've been going good. I've been reading my Bible good. I've been, I've been getting close to the Lord good. I'm just gonna, you know, take just take a little break. And then what happens? Poverty comes on you like a robber, and want like an armed man. I want, but I can't have because I didn't put in the work. Um, <clears throat> so then there's this idea that laziness spreads, the I earned it mentality. I've done good, so I, earn, I earned this break. Um, and before you know it, it's something that, that really just gets all over in your life, and, uh, and poverty comes on you. So then in verse 12 through, verses 12 through 15, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. So first off, notice how um, he really points to the in, to the wholeness of this person. Okay? A worthless person, a wicked person, equated, equated as the same person, goes about with crooked speech. So the first thing they do is they say things that sound real good. For a speech to be crooked, it means that it sounds real good, but it's perverse. It's something that's not right. It's something that's covered up with, with you know, think of a trap that, that has leaves over the top of it that, you know, it's a crooked. Uh, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger. Just the, the idea of this whole person is just this, He's just a, a, a bad person. <laughs> uh, with perverted heart devises evil, continu continually sowing discord. So looks um, he looks the part, and he sounds good, but is evil inside. Notice how it, the, the whole analogy here, I guess you could say, um, whatever you want to say, the proverb, let's just say that. The proverb climaxes with his heart. With perverted heart devises evil. See, because of his perverted heart, the other things, see what I mean, kind of ties it all in. Mm -hmm. Um, continually sowing discord. Um, the thing is, though, about this worthless person, oftentimes you won't see them sowing discord. Oftentimes they'll have a, they'll have a, um, you know, the, the, because they play the part, they'll look they like somebody. Do what? They do it in right, they do it in secret and stuff. They, they do things where they look like they're an honest, you know, good person and everything. And only when you really start to pay attention do you, do you see the, do you see the deceit. You know, and, and the sad thing is. Um, a lot of older Christians ha have gotten into this place in America. I can't speak elsewhere, but America I can. Because we get this idea that, you know, I've been here the longest, so I have superiority in the club. And I, uh, you know, I, I've contributed the most financially, so, I mean, I have earned this position. 
you know, and this idea that, um, well, you know, you start to connive to, to make sure that the church stays how you want it to be. Because the pastor leads it in a direction you like, um, people are, are coming that you don't like them, you know, whatever. Uh, traditions that you've held for so long since you were a kid are suddenly just thrown away. Uh, one of those traditions we see is, is Christians not dressing up for church. I mean, this is just a wicked, evil thing, you know, and it, it's not really, but, you know, you get this idea that yeah. we're losing our church. It's like, it's just clothes. Right. Well, at first it's clothes, but tomorrow it's, you know, well, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, this idea that this... Uh, People this, forget what's the meaning of the church. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. So we see in verse 15, though, the evil is exposed in a moment, and he will lose his name. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. The idea here is that someone who who is uh, who goes around with crooked speech, this person who, who plays the part and looks real good, when he is found out, and he will be, so when he is found out, Calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. Because all this, all this house of cards that he's been working so diligently to build will be exposed as just that, a house of cards. It's not anything real great, and in a moment, it can be snuffed out. Um, so just this, this contrast between how he's portraying himself and his, and his ultimate end. Um, so the last uh, four verses I want to pay special uh, attention to. I'll read it through, and then we'll break it break it down verse by verse. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. So let's count those, okay? Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. How many are there? Seven. Seven. So let's start that over again. There are six things that the Lord hates. What? Uh, this is just a ba just basically a, a, a style of writing where you start with it. And, like There are six things. Yes, even seven. You know what I mean? It's just a way of writing. Right. Um, well, not so much at least six. It's just a way of, of uh, building it up. Like, um, um, I worked hard two weeks, even three. You know, you, you know the, the idea of, of, of making it, um, emphasizing the point that, that these are very wicked things. It just, it's not really something that we use today, but back in the day they used it. Right. So, right. Right. <laughs> uh, if you wrote like this today, you'd be like, huh? why not just say seven things? Because Americans are more precise; they want exact details. Yeah. But that's not really how the Jews worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, in fact, when I was a kid. I went to this church, and this woman told me about how the Jews were very, very persnickety. persnickety. They kept exact records and everything. And then as I grew older and I did the research, I learned, no, actually, Jews weren't like that. <laughs> um, they kind of got like that when the Pharisees around the time of Jesus because they were trying to perfectly maintain the law. But that was years after the Old Testament was written, <laughs> years afterwards. So anyways, um, so there are actually seven things. That's just an introductory to the seven things. And uh, the thing that he says about it, it's an abomination to him, or some translations say that the Lord hates these things, yeah. uh, whichever translation you have. Um, in fact, if in mine it says hates and then abomination. What what do you guys have? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Some some translations uh, use use that. Some say other things. Uh, but yeah, detestable. Detestable. Yeah. And what does it say in the first part? Um, hates. Hates. Yeah. Okay, so it's the, the idea here is something that is completely against God's character. He completely despises it. Right. Um, uh, a mint one, please. I uh, completely despises it. So, so the idea here, I think uh, Ross stated pretty great. Um, so why say it yourself when somebody else has already said it? Good. Uh, <laughs> that's the role of uh, of uh, college. Um, these are taboo. These seven things are taboo. God is opposed to them, separate from, from them, and will punish those who do them. It's the idea of complete separation from them. In God, there is none of these things. There are none of these things. So um, that kind of warrants a slowdown to say, hey, what are these seven things that are so anti-God? The first thing is haughty eyes. Now I don't know about you, but I have never heard the term haughty eyes outside of the Bible. <laughs> Basically, what it means is pride or arrogance. Uh, to have haughty eyes is to lift your eyes up, you know, like, so oh, I. You know what I mean? It's that idea of, 
looking. Can I have a duty? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, no. Mm. More, more prideful and arrogant. I think that you're well, kind of snooty. Kind of. Kind of. Better. Kind of. Um, think a little bit more. Um, think a step worse than snooty. There's this whole thing uh, that he goes into with explaining uh, the Hebrew idea of it, and it's actually very interesting. But I didn't want to waste your time, so I just whoop, dropped it out. I wanted to, but I was like, this is just a pointless detail that I liked that is just going to add more time. So uh, the first thing is haughty eyes, which is basically pride and arrogance. Um, a lying tongue, and notice how he goes down. He starts with the eyes, and he goes to the tongue. Okay. Uh, a lying tongue, this is pretty easy to, yeah. to determine. As someone who, 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 who is deceitful, who manipulates people, who, who straight out lies or white lies. You know, these things where you're twisting the truth of what actually happened. Um, as seven things that are abomination, him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue. The third thing, hand, yes, hands that shed innocent blood. And the idea here is um, just someone who is very self-centered they do, they do things as they see fit rather than how god see fits and sees fit they, they, they do wrong they mistreat others the, the idea of shedding innocent blood is someone who didn't deserve it and also the idea of shedding innocent blood is with you know the hands thing is that it's a very uh, personal thing this person you know what i mean it's not something that, that that you just sat back and did it's the idea of you were included in this evil thing um and the idea of you know shedding innocent blood it, it's something where um where it's just an act of immorality. Does that kind of make sense? So I could say more, but I think that at this point I'm just more stumbling over my words than anything, so I'm just going to plow <laughs> through. Play through. Uh, the fourth thing, one, two, three, yes, fourth thing is the heart. He says in verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans. Now, in, in Hebrew thought, the heart... Okay, let's just start with in modern thought. In modern thought, when people thought, think about the heart, they think about the root of your feelings, right? Yeah. When you mean something with your whole heart, it means that you, um, emotionally speaking, you are fully committed to the thing that you are saying. Mm -hmm. I love you with my whole heart. It's the idea of – it's more of the seat of emotions. Whereas in Hebrew thought, the heart is more of the seat of your will, the seat of your, your reasoning and your logic, the seat of, of your core self. Your will, your inner desire. Okay, um, so the idea here is that the will is bent on self-service and evil. It's built. It's bent on your own ways, and it's bent on on doing things wrong. Um, a heart that devises wicked plans, and then the last thing at the very bottom of the person: uh, eyes, tongue, hands, heart, feet. Is the idea um, of agreement with sin. Notice how he says it. A feet that make haste to run to evil. It's something that, that it doesn't stop and think about. It. It's not something that, you know, just, well, should I do this? It's not something that, you know, even it hesitates. It's something that runs to it as soon as there's an, as soon as there's an opportunity. Um, and actually, that's going to come in play when he talks about the adulterer again, that, that people who, who are, are adultery run to these things. And we'll come right back to that. So keep that, you know, keep a pin on that. Um, but pay attention as you read the Old Testament to this phrase about – um, uh, in the end of verse 17, hands that shed innocent blood, because that's actually something that, that is a resounding theme throughout the whole Old Testament. Yeah. And it's just this idea that, I mean, really, that's probably one, one of the more important points here in, in this little section here. Hands that shed innocent blood, just that idea that I, I, don't, I can't think of anything that I haven't already said about it. Um, Basically, in the Old Testament, there's this idea of um, immorality corrupts the land, and it leaves a scar that, 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 that cries out to God. We see this in Sodom and Gomorrah. We see this when Cain uh, kills Abel. We see this all throughout the Bible, the, the Old Testament, I should say, the Old Testament, of this idea of, of something crying out to the Lord. And so when somebody re receives unjust treatment, it cries out to – it is a cry to the Lord that, that, that the Lord won't ignore. See, I mean, he's patient with the person who's doing this wrong, but he nevertheless won't won't ignore it. Um, you know, and like for instance, one of the things that, that Proverbs talks about: if you don't withhold the pay from the workman, give it to them. Right. You know, oh, I, I I didn't I don't like their attitude. I don't like the way that they work. I'll, I'll just give it to them tomorrow. I'm busy tonight. Don't withhold the pay from the person. Why? Because this is an evil thing done to that person. 
why protect widows and orphans? Because they're on the very bottom of the ring in society back then. See what I mean? They're at the lowest of the lows. Today it would be drug addicts and uh, orphans really aren't that looked down on anymore, uh, in America at least. Um, but drug addicts really are. And, uh, you know, people like that. So today it would be watch out for the drug addicts, you know, and the alcoholics. Uh, but, yeah, there's, there's, there's that idea. Um, not that we shouldn't take care of widows and orphans, but the idea is, you know, Helping why because because it's the idea of innocent innocent blood, you know the idea of unjust treatment that they're getting something that they did not deserve and God is completely opposed to that. Um, so oftentimes we think, well, why is this unfair thing happening? God, why aren't you here? And God's meanwhile just being patient with the person who's doing the wrong thing. So uh, I've I've kind of run too long on that, but uh, in summation of the hand, whole hands thing, as you read the Old Testament, pay attention to that because you're going to see that in, in I believe First Kings, maybe Second Kings, but I think it's First Kings. Um, anyways, so then the next thing is a false witness, which kind of goes along with with the attitude of these other things. You know, he already said about the lying tongue. He already said about the heart that devises wicked plans. So he's right on track when he talks about in verse 19 a false witness who breathes out lies. And false witness is the idea of a false testimony in court or other arenas, somebody who makes up stories so that uh, you know to skew justice, because God absolutely loves justice. So that anything that prevents that. Is, is is not good um, in God's eyes. Um, so then, this last part is, is especially interesting. The one who sows discord against uh, among brothers. The idea of sowing is that you're you're you're, you're planting in it. You're, you're you're stirring it up. You're causing it to grow. Okay. Uh, just I I really like that that imagery. One who sows discord among brothers. It's not just you know. You get in a tiff. Sows discord among brothers. So let's kind of break this one up. Um, that idea is kind of synonymous with a problem maker, a quarrel maker, someone who's short-tempered, someone who, who causes other people to be short-tempered, kind of pushes people in, into an attitude. Um, an antagonistic, that's a great word to describe it. Someone who causes problems. You know, in, in stories, in, in literature classes, they, they say when you're writing a story, you know, the antagonist, that's the person who causes the problem that needs to be resolved, right? So like in Cinderella, for instance, it would be probably the stepmother, the evil stepmother would be the antagonist. She's the one who kind of caused things to go bad for Cinderella. There was nothing for Cinderella to rise above unless it was the stepmother causing the problem, and then she had something to rise above. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Uh, in Lord of the Rings, the antagonist would be Sauron, who made the rings of power. In Star Wars, it would be the Emperor. And uh, you see what I mean? It, it's that idea of the antagonist. Uh, Star Trek did it in another way. They had they, uh, they made the um, the guys with the things on their forehead. Uh, Klingon? Klingon. Yeah. Made the Klingons as antagonists, yeah. but then brought resolution through the peace. With the, you, You've right. seen the movie. Uh, but there's that idea, and, and that's the kind of thing that I want you to imagine. What, whatever your favorite movie is, just think about the bad guy. Okay, And, and that's the kind of image I want you to get when he says this. One who sows discord among brothers. One who is literally tearing these people apart. And notice the familial relationship there. Sows discord among who? Brothers. People who are closely knit. Tears them apart. Someone who comes to the scene and wrecks havoc. Um, so just that an idea of the, ant the antagonist. Um, people who pit children. Here's some modern day examples of this. People who pit children against each other. Who make it like a competition between the siblings that they have to do better than the other one. Uh, people who uh, take sides in a controversy. Oh, well, Chuck got his feelings hurt about this, so I'm going to take his side about this. And, you see what I mean? The idea of... Uh, of of taking of taking sides in the controversy, or someone who just encourages bad attitudes. You hear somebody upset about something, so you just say these little things and just solidify that bad attitude. But yeah, like, like poking someone who's already pissed off. Just keep poking them. <laughs> um, so if I already talked about this, it talks about this the these seven things with with a with a person going down from their eyes down to their feet. Um, the whole of a person is the idea that, that, that the entirety of this person. Um, and then also the last thing I want to kind of emphasize about this is the strong contrast that is in this passage as compared to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now I'm going to read this, pass this little uh, four verses over again, and then I'm going to read Matthew. And tell me if you guys start seeing any uh, real strong comparisons between the two. Okay. 
So let's read uh, Proverbs first. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven things that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Then we go to Matthew chapter 5. Um, I'm sorry, we can we can skip verses 1 and 2 because that's not really what Jesus is saying. We'll start in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, this started out with someone who has haughty eyes, a prideful person. Whereas Jesus started his out with the person who's poor in spirit, the humble person. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. It means to be humble. Um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, we have a purity of heart, whereas here we had um, a heart that devises wicked plans. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Whereas here it said, uh, one who sows discord among brothers. Then you keep going, because <laughs> Jesus, hold on. Verse 10, blessed are those... Who are, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Someone who does right, even though it, they're not treated fairly for it. And then over here we had what? Uh, feet that make haste to run to evil, false witness who breathes out lies. Well, false witnesses persecute people who don't deserve it, right? Well, so what about those people who don't deserve it who are still being persecuted? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see the contrast between what Jesus said in Proverbs? Proverbs is warning about the evil. Jesus is talking about the benefits of the good. Right. But they're obviously using the exact same basis of yeah. God's character. Um, blessed are, are you when others uh, revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For uh, um, So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, and... One more thing. Um, it, one guy I was reading was trying to argue that there are seven um, of these uh, Beatitudes in chapter 5. Um, I can't figure out how he arrived at seven. Uh, because in my account, it is a bare minimum of eight, if not nine. So I don't know if I'm just doing that wrong or what thought I'd say that to you. The reason why I think that's neat is because Jesus talked for longer about the benefits of righteousness yeah. than so Solomon talked about the curses of unrighteousness. I thought that was interesting. But anyways, um, so there's that contrast there. So then, remember when I said that there's a contrast in the Bible? They highlight the things that are not true of the opposite? Yeah. So if these are seven things that God hates, then the things that God must love are humility, Truthful speech, preservation of life, rather than the shedding of innocent blood, preservation of life, pure thoughts. Did you know that there's the idea nowadays that people are even – there? a lot of people even agree that, that fetuses are people. They just don't deserve to live. In essence, the exact same things that people said about blacks. Maybe they're people. Who knows? But they don't deserve freedom. We can kill them and it's fine. They're just blacks. In essence, the exact same thing. And the thing is, is that people who are saying this about abortion are the same people who are parroting for the rights of, of blacks. That doesn't follow. Whereas in the Bible, God talks about the preservation of all life. Should blacks be given? Yes, absolutely. This isn't even up for debate. Yeah. <laughs> Of course blacks should be treated equal with whites. Of course. All people are equal in God's eyes. All people have worth. However, in that, we shouldn't overlook the babies just because they haven't been born yet. You know, And so there's this idea that why should I care? It's, who cares about abortion? Why should I care? Because God cares about life. God cares about the preservation of life. And so we should too. And there's the idea of pure thoughts. Um, five, eagerness to do good things, whereas the wicked person has these has these feet that are just waiting to go towards evil. God must therefore love eagerness to do good things. When you just when you just want to do the right thing, just because it's the right thing to do. 
Uh, when we when we're kids, right? Our our parents threaten us that if we do the wrong thing, there'll be results, right? Like spankings yeah. or timeouts or grounding or whatever you guys use. Yeah, bad consequences. Uh, right, some kind of thing like that. God doesn't want that to be our relationship with Him. Right. Well, I better do the right thing because God will punish me. He wants it to be like this. God, I love you so much. I want to do the right thing. Right. See what I mean? God doesn't want us to be threatened into doing the right thing. He wants us to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Because it's the right thing, he wants us to do the right thing. No other reason. God, I want to do what you want me to do because it's the right thing. That, that's it. I don't, and I'm not doing it so that I can twist your arm and get special blessings and claim, you know, name it and claim it. I'm not doing it for those things. I'm doing it because it's right in your eyes, and I want to do what's right in your eyes. And that's what God really wants to see. People who are, who are humble before him and just want, to, just want to do his – Lord, I submit to you. You do your thing, and I'm just going to follow along. Um, so then there's the idea of honest witnesses, and the last thing, peaceful harmony. If these thing are things are seven things that God hates in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, we can know that these seven things are things that God loves because they're the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. That looks like it has a lot of sugar in it. No. No? Because it looks like it does. It's fries with... Um, just chocolate. Not judging. Uh, later. Um, chocolate and brownies and stuff make it hard to talk. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Is everybody done writing? Okay, awesome. So then that takes us to the 11th message, which is actually kind of a long one. Um, and you can break it up between chapter 6, uh, 20 to the end of the chapter, and then a second part B... Um, in chapter 7, or you can see it as one big long message, whatever you want to do. Um, but if you add A and B, you're going to have 14 messages rather than 13. So remember that. You're going to be one number off. <laughs> and the idea here is just the consequences of sexual sin. Um, and it's something that, that's warned very, very strongly against throughout Proverbs, um, but uh, especially in this part here. So let's look at it, okay? We'll start off uh, with just reading, and if you have any questions, let me know. Um, well, before I do that, did anybody have any questions on the, about the 10th message? No? Okay, awesome. My son, keep your father's commandment, and forsake not your mother's teaching. We already talked about that a couple weeks ago, so we're not going to look at that verse. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. Now, this is something that we are going to look at. We already looked at the tying them around your neck thing and the way it makes you more graceful, that thing. But there's something else here. It says, bind them on your heart always. Bind them on your heart always. Now, there's a few things. Always. This kind of seems to imply the idea of it's something that you need to consistently pay attention to wisdom. Bind them on it always. Well, if it's bound on my heart, why do I have to pay attention to it? Because just because you have wisdom doesn't mean you, you always listen to wisdom. But true wisdom is falling through on the wisdom that you know is wisdom. <laughs> I can see. So uh, bind them. The heart is the center of the will. Remember we talked about that just a second ago? So to bind the, uh, the, uh, the wisdom, the, the teachings of the parents on your heart is to bind it to your will, to make your decisions based off of wisdom. See what he's saying there? Make all decisions with care according to wisdom. Anytime you're making a decision, do so wisely and patiently because – why? Because you have wisdom bound to your heart. You're constantly always binding it to your, to your will. Everything that you're deciding to do, I want to move, I want to change the shop, I want to do anything that is your will. You're binding that wisdom to your will. Remember that? Okay. And then uh, we go through from there. Bind them on your heart. Always tie them around your neck. Verse 22. When you walk, they will lead you. We already looked at this a couple weeks ago, so I'm not going to really look at this. He just kind of reiterates what he already said in previous chapters. When you lie down, they will watch over you, and when you wait, awake, they will talk with you. Uh, for the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Wow, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's try and break it down. First off, wisdom is a lamp, a light, and life. Okay, so the idea of, of a lamp, a light, it's something that guides your path, right? You can see what's ahead. You can see where you're going. You can see to not stumble on, stumble your feet, and that's the idea of wisdom. Either way in life, you're going to be walking down the same path. Do you want to accidentally fall over the cliff? Do you want to stub your toe on the rocks? Do you want to get bit by snakes, or do you want to have a lamp that can 
guide you in the pro as, as you're going through the process. Not that you're not trusting God with your life, not that you're not listening to God's direction, but that you're listening to wisdom in order to... Should I cheat on my wife? No, this is a bad thing. See? That that idea. Well, the, the fool doesn't pay attention to that. Yeah, why not? This chick's hot, why not? Right, on this eternal quest to find a hotter chick than the wife that you already have. Right? That's what the fool does. Always on this quest to find something bigger and better. Um, well, not all guys are into big women, so maybe smaller and better. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. That's a joke. I kid, I kid. Uh, anyways, um, but then check out what he says here at the end of the verse. Uh, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. The reproofs of discipline. A reproof is something that uh, – what's another word for reproof? Uh, like a correction. correction. Yes, yes. I'm very impressed with you guys. Golden star for you two. Uh, reproof is like a correction. Uh, in verse 23, the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. The corrections of, of, of discipline. Um, so if you notice, commandments, teachings, discipline, these are all part of wisdom. They're things that come from parents. They're things that come from authority. So uh, all that. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. So obviously he's not talking about things that just, oh, this, you know, if I have wisdom, I'm always going to want to do what's right. Reproofs of discipline. Listening to the advice of others. Listening to the, to the correction of others. The reproofs of discipline are the ways of life. I saw a very, very, very good picture. It showed a guy at a, at a guardrail over a cliff. And he said, I want, I'm going to jump over that guardrail. And the guy said, wait, 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 don't do that. And then in the other one, it showed that he jumped over, and it was a straight, solid cliff. And, and, the guy, and the other guy said, it was there for your protection. And that's the idea of the disciplines here. Because not everything we want to do is good. But the reproofs of discipline are that guardrail that say, hey, that's a cliff. You're not going to want to do that. See, the world says we just do whatever we want, right? If you want to cheat, go ahead. If you want to um, steal, go ahead. If you want to do all these things, go ahead. But the reproofs of wisdom say, hey, did, 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 did. hold on, not a good idea. Because that's a road that you don't want to be going down. And that's kind of the heart of the passages that we've been looking at throughout chapters 1 all the way through up till 6 are these things that they've been talking about and why you shouldn't do them. <laughs> because it's not wise. Why is it not wise? Well, these are the, the effects of that. Well, how do we start out the, the lesson tonight? We talked. We looked at that guy, a uh, worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with, work, with crooked speech. right? We looked at that guy in, in verses 12 through 15. See, now we know a guardrail, right? But if you read in um, Galatians and Romans, they both talk about it. By God showing wisdom to people, that actually encouraged some people to disobey God even more. It's like this. Have you ever told a child not to touch a stove and so they wouldn't touch a stove just to show you? Yeah. yeah. Just to teach you a lesson? Right. God says that that's the exact same thing when he gave his law. He gave it as a guide to people. He gave Proverbs to us as a guide for us to learn and to grow. But because of the revealed wisdom of God, it encouraged some people, or, or uh, the wording is more of um, taught them to sin. By God revealing the right way, it encouraged rebellious people to rebel even more. Pretty powerful statements there in Galatians and Romans. Yeah. Um, and we'll probably look at that some other time. But anyways, uh, going back to verse 23, the commandment is a lamp. The teaching of light, the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Uh, so let's go head on down past there. To preserve you from the evil woman, from this – see, he was talking in generalities. Now he's looking a little more specific. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. And the same thing can be said to girls about guys, right? Right? Because there's a lot of smooth guys out there. A smooth criminal. No Michael Jackson fans. Uh, for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. And we'll look at this in just a second. But a married woman hunts down a precious life. So there's there's just so much in here, and I really wish we could we could spend more time, but we really just don't have we don't have the time. Um so one thing he talks about to preserve you from the evil one, something that keeps you from, from making a huge mistake, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, from the things that, oh, it just sounded so good. Um, do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not, so let, let's, let's, let's stop there for a minute. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. The idea of when you're not being tempted, tempting yourself with it. 
You know what I'm talking about? Surely you guys have never done this, right? Thinking about it and how much you want it and not just sexual things. I'm saying also like other things too, like, you know, that other car, that other, I mean, whatever it is you guys yeah. fantasize about it, you know, whatever. Um, do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. I love that wording there, capture you. <laughs> uh, anyways, so here we see the contrast of committed people and non-committed people in verse 26. He is not condoning prostitution, but prostitution was a practice that was common in that day. Okay, So he's not condoning prostitution. Okay, Just so we're all on the same page. All that he's saying here, he's saying the contrast here. The price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. You can pay a prostitute... You have sex, and the deed's done. There's there, there's no way that the husband's going to get vengeance. Why go to adultery with this person who's committed? The prostitute isn't committed to anyone. The wife is committed to somebody, or the husband, either or, whichever you are. Um, so why would you do this thing? Uh, and then he says, he says there at the end of the verse, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Someone who is willing to commit adultery, this is something that it, you're being led into a trap. They are... They're hunting down the precious life. Mm -hmm. So um, today, uh, so he's, uh, another thing is that people misunderstand is, okay, so he's condoning sex outside of marriage then. No, 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 no. Um, once again, it, it's for the sake of it, it's just a contrast here. A prostitute is someone who's complete, a, a prostitute is the definition of not being committed. Because prostitutes have sex with literally anybody. But marriage is the symbol of commitment. It's a symbol of commitment that nothing else is, no one else is ever going to come between you two. See what I mean? So it, it's just as a contrast. It's not condoning prostitution. It's not condoning sex outside of marriage. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, another thing we're going to clarify in a minute is is uh, rape because this is a rape culture. Rape has been in the news a lot, and a lot of um, overly religious people have used Bible in a lot of times to condone rape. And so we're going to look at that in a minute. But first, let's stay on target here. Um, you will know how to handle life, general guidelines of life. We already looked at that. Um, and then if you look here in the next verse, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? There's the idea there of inner lusts lead to outer destruction. Well, I'm just thinking about it. No, no, no. It's like Jesus said. If you've done it in your heart, you've already done it. Stop it at the heart. Stop it at the source. There's this idea that, you know, and Jesus wasn't saying it to beat people up. He was saying, saying it to give a word of warning. If you're letting this, this adultery carry on in your heart, that's where you're headed. You need to cut it off. If you are allowing this in your heart, he wasn't necessarily saying that to think about it is to commit the sin. That's not necessarily what he was saying. I personally do believe that if you lust about something, you are sinning. That is my personal belief, and I believe that's what Jesus is kind of implying. But that's not the point of what Jesus was saying. The point of what Jesus is saying is that when you allow it into your heart like that, the actions will follow. In fact, he even says later, or earlier, I don't remember which, from the abundance of the, of, of the heart the mouth speaks. He's, get, he's teaching a principle. When you let something into your heart, when you let it replay in your heart, it's going to come out. So what do you do with, with bad feelings? Don't let them take root. Forgive your neighbor. If, if your enemy has something, if your brother has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go immediately and make make, make amends with the person. That, there's that idea there of just, well, you get what I'm saying. Um, so that I, so this thing here is, 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 is a principle that goes beyond just adultery. You cannot carry sin to your chest and clothes not be burned. You cannot hold a, 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 a fire to your to your chest and, and your clothes not be burned. It's an impossibility, and that's a principle. But um, with lust, it's especially true because lust is considered that that burning of the heart, right? The burning. Yeah. So obviously, he, but I mean, you see what I'm saying? Sin is destructive and will not leave you unaffected. Sin will affect your life, and not only that, but it will affect others too. Um. So let's let's keep looking here. Um. In verses 27 through 35. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So one thing, though, although this is a broader principle talking about life principles in general, sin and whatnot, um, it is very much so talking about adultery as well. Uh, fire next to his chest, that's you know the initial, that's the initial burning. 
that you feel in, in lust towards someone. But then, so he um, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? That's the idea of repeating the action. That's a, that's the, that's the idea of going on to the action. When you're actually putting your feet to action and and the and the decision you've decided to, decided to make, because um, there's a difference between talking about cheating and there's a difference between carrying it out, and that's what he's talking about here. When you're talking about it, is the burning burning your burning your chest, but when you're walking on the hot coals, that's the actual carrying it out and repeating it. The uh, the walk of shame is what some people call it. Um, so is he who goes into his neighbor's wife, none who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does, does it destroys himself. He who gets wounds, uh... He will get uh, get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though, uh, though you multiply gifts. A lot is said here, but the first thing that's that I want to say is I know it seems like the whole thing about the thief is just thrown in there willy-nilly. Solomon is trying to draw a contrast between the sin of thievery and the sin of adultery. Now, we'll get back to that in a second. Just hold on a second. Thieves have compassion when hungry. If someone is hungry and they steal food, people nevertheless feel a little bit of compassion for them, right? Yeah. Oh, you should just ask and I'll give it to you, we always say, right? All right. But then when people actually steal from us, we say, well, oh, put them in jail, right? right? But then when they're caught, even if, the, even if they have the excuse of, oh, I was hungry, they're still expected to pay back greatly. Everybody calls for them to be put in jail, to be arrested, to, to be, you know, to pay sevenfold is what Solomon says. And this is just th thievery. Things that can be replaced. Things, right? Mm -hmm. So how much more the adulterer? Adulterers will carry the weight and their hunger is passing. See, the thieves' hunger, that could actually lead to death, but yet they're exp still expected to pay for their crime sevenfold if they're caught. The adulterer, that's a passing lust. See what I mean? Anybody who's been married can tell you. When you first get with your spouse, like, you're crazy about them. Oh my gosh, you're always thinking about them. And then as you get married, it's not that you love them any less. It's that it's not new anymore. You know what I mean? It's not – you're still attracted to them. You know what I mean? But it's easier to not be satisfied with their appearance as you grow older. They get wrinkles. They get gray hair. You know, they're not perfect anymore. You know what I mean? Before you got married, this person was perfect. They, they never made any mistakes. Nothing, that, nothing they ever did made you mad. But then after you, after you get married, well, then everything that they do makes you mad. See what I mean? And all of a sudden, you you have to learn to grow spiritually in an area that you didn't you didn't even know you needed to before. I didn't have a hard a hard time forgiving uh, this person we were dating, but now they're doing the exact same thing. But it's annoying now. They used to do this cute thing when they now that I'm married, it's, it's ah, <laughs> close you with your mouth closed. You know what I mean? <laughs> so adulterers will carry the weight. He who commits adultery lacks sense. Literally, this is one of the stupidest things you can do. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. He'll carry this. Oh, there goes Michael, the one who cheated on his wife. Oh, there goes Michael, the one that I can't trust to be around my wife. See what I mean? It's something that you carry around with you. Your name is shattered. It's something that carry the weight for forever. You can still, you can still, and and and. For, don't read too much into this, but you can be a thief, get caught. After you get out of jail, and people just like whatever, right? I mean, just don't steal anymore, right. you know. But adultery—that's something that people tend to be a little more touchy about, especially when it's their spouse. Which is why he says here at the end of the chapter, "For jealousy makes a man furious. He will not spare when he takes revenge. He'll do whatever he can to seek the full compensation for your punishment. He will accept no compensation. No, basically, right. you can't you can't pay him off. You can't make him make his anger happy." His anger will burn against you, um, and he will refuse, though you multiply gifts. Ugh. Today was a great, great day, wasn't it? Great weather. No? I really like the weather. We went, we went and took the kids to the zoo. Had a great time. It was too hot? Well, we, we took off about one something, so right about the time that it started getting real hot, we were, we were oh, no, 1230, so we were, we fine. So anyways, 
um, so there's just this, this this contrast here between um, how how adultery is it burns you, how how it contrasted to other things like thievery, um, and then the idea that that see because that's the thing is adultery people always justify right. My spouse they withdraw from me. They're not the same person that I married. They they don't treat me with love anymore. They, it's the thing that right everybody has a billion excuses for why it's okay for them to commit adultery. But what Solomon says here is literally you lack sense when you do this thing. Just because you are irritated with your spouse, you're going to do this terrible thing that's going to have eternal results on your life. See what I mean? And he calls it the stupidest thing you can do here. So anyways, going to chapter 7. <clears throat> Wisdom removes many temptations. We'll come back to that, I think. Um, both adulterers are at fault. If you look at this, um, I'll, I'll you know I'll go ahead through chapter seven and I think we'll mm, yeah I'll, we'll we'll go through chapter seven before we look at these because I want you guys to have a basis for what we're talking about. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with with uh, with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call inside your intimate friend, and keep you from to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. So, um, well, let's go on through, through chapter 8 here. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I, sim I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. And here the idea of youth is the idea of someone who's not matured in life, still giving, still giving themselves over to the passions of the lusts. Right? Uh, I've seen 50-year-olds that can still be called a youth. <laughs> I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing along the streets near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening at the time of night and darkness. Behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens with Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him at full moon, and he will come home. You know, these the same tricks are still true today. Do you know how many pornos I watched when I was younger? They had that exact same storyline in them. The husband was gone away to business, and that was the start of the porno. The exact same thing, and it's been thousands of years, and there's, uh, we're still fooled by the same tricks of the enemy guys this is sad with much seductive speech she persuades him with her smooth talk she compels him all at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or a stag is caught fast um until an arrow pierces a sliver as a bird rushes into a snare he does not know uh, that it will cost him his life uh, stag, just think dear. Let's simplify yeah, things. Dear. Just think dear. It's fine. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way, way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Now, Sheol is, is basically the grave. Let's let's simplify things. We could go into a whole word study. We're not going to do that. Sheol, Sheol basically in the Old Testament means the grave. Like when Jacob talks about um, – um, he's talking with his sons, and they say, look, this guy in Egypt's not going to give us any food unless you send Benjamin with us because we accidentally spilled the beans, and he knows that we have a younger brother. Well, it turned out to be Joseph. You guys probably know the story in Genesis. Uh, and he says, y you're going to bring my head down in sorrow to Sheol. What does it mean? It means I'm going to die of grief. That, that's all it means. It's just a, a word that, that, that you – and I know people really get carried away with that. Don't get too carried away with that. So there's a few things that we see in, the, in this whole whole thing. The first thing is that wisdom removes many temptations. Because this 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 foolish guy, look what he's doing. In verse 8. Uh, no, no, verse 7. I have seen among the simple, I have received among the youth a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner. Well, a wise person isn't passing near her, street, near her house, is he? He's going some other way. Wisdom removes many temptations. I'm strong enough. Don't tempt yourself. Be wise enough to avoid the opportunity of temptation. 
what is it that you have a hard time with? Well, every time I go to the store, I spend a bunch of money. Leave the credit card at home. Have a list and only take out the cash you know for those things and don't use the credit card. Well, if your temptation is pornography, unplug the internet box if, no, if nobody else is at home but yourself. If your problem is overeating, don't buy a bunch of snacks. Don't shop when you're hungry. <laughs> I have no idea what I did with my phone. I hear it. <laughs> Under Grace's computer? Oh yeah! yeah. Oops. I actually muted it. That's not good, because then it's going to go off again. <clears throat> okay. The second thing that we see is that both adulterers are at fault. In chapter 6, he more emphasized you... You know, doing this thing, and in chapter 7, he more emphasized you being tricked into doing this thing. Either way, both adulterers are at fault. Even if you were tricked, even if the other person was asking for it, okay? I know there's the rape term right there, asking for it. They were asking for it. Let me come back to that. Hold on. So now we have two messages. Men, control your lusts. Women, don't tempt. Now, this is only true about adultery. I am not talking about rape. Because what people say is they say something along, along the lines of this. She shouldn't have dressed so pro provocatively. Rape is unjustifiable no matter what the woman was dressed like. Okay, That is something that you need to control yourself. She didn't have it. She didn't ask for it. This is asking for it. Can you do this? This is not asking for it. You're catching the difference. It, I, we were watching this video and it was compared to asking for a cup of tea. If somebody says, I would like a cup of tea, they want a cup of tea, and you can give them a cup of tea. That's not rape, then, is it? That's called sex. If so, if somebody doesn't want a cup of tea and you, you force them to drink a cup of tea, that's, that's bad, right? Same thing with rape. If somebody says, hey, I want this cup of tea, so you make them the cup of tea, but then once you, they, you give it to them, they say, I no longer want that cup of tea. You can't force them to drink it. It's the same thing with sex. If somebody implied and thought that they wanted sex, but then they make it clear they no longer wanted or they didn't after all, to carry it through, that's called rape. So are we clear on the distinction between rape and consensual sex? Because I'm only talking about in this passage right here consent, the idea of consensual sex. So when there's two of you, you both can do your part. Men, control your lusts. Ben, control your lusts. <laughs> And women, don't tempt the guy, because you know that women have their wiles. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys watch Firefly, your wiles, the, your uncanny ability to make a man sweaty and or um, more compliant to do your will, or something like that. I forget what he says. Firefly is a great show. You guys should watch yeah. it. Um, so, a little side note here. Rape is never justified. They were not asking for it. We're not talking about rape at all. We're talking about consensual sex. It is not the woman's fault for getting raped because of how she dressed. And she and um, But with all those things being said, women, don't create a low image of, of, of other women by how you dress. I found that so stupid that people like Miley Cyrus and whatnot were all like, oh, I'm not going to vote for Trump because he degrades women, but I'm going to go into my shows humping this dude, dressing like a slut, all these things – you know, and it's fine for me to do it because why? They were degrading the image of women just like Trump did. See what I mean? So have respect for your for your gender. Let me just say that. But with all those things said, back to this. Um, see, that's something called a side note. The reason why I had to make that side note is because there's so much stupid stuff in the media nowadays. I okay. don't want to get too far off topic, though. Um, and there's this idea of just, just the two of them carrying it through. I think there was something else I was going to say, but I might have forgotten. Oh yeah. Um, so back on the consensual thing, what you what sometimes women do is they dress in a way to turn heads. You know what I mean? And then they kind of tease guys. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know how to say this. Flirt with them without the intention of going anywhere. Guys are kind of like a. Uh, a generator. Really easy to start them up. Just pull that wire. They're on. But once they're on, it's not a good idea to turn them immediately off. It kind of causes the, you know, hey, I don't want to get too far off here on the analogy, but you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying. 
not a great idea. So I, what, my, my recommendation is twofold. Men, control your lusts. Women, don't tempt. I'm not saying, you know, it's your fault if you get raped. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is your Christian brothers should mean enough to you that you don't do things that you know are going to put them in a place of, you see what I mean, of, of lust. But with that being said, there is no excuse for your lust, guys. You are completely responsible for your own lust. I'm just saying, side note for the women, folk. Everybody understand those things? Because yeah. there seems to be a big misunderstanding about this in our culture, so I don't know how much of this you know, is in here or not. If there are any other questions, like, don't be afraid to stop me. I, I, I can make it more awkward if you want. Um, so there's a, there's a few things here. First thing is that he led himself into temptation. We already looked at that in verses 7 through 8 when it says he passed along the street near her, her corner, uh, taking the road to her house. And the idea here in Hebrew is that – not the Hebrews, but the language of Hebrew. <laughs> ah, ah, laugh. That's better. Uh, is the idea of a willful walking, the idea of a purposeful and intentional direction. Okay, he Led himself into temptation. Um, and then the other thing is that sex seems pretty innocent to him. Look at this. And the twilight in the evening at the time of night and darkness. I mean, obviously, you know, this idea of, of, of being covered in everything, and, and, and he's just completely oblivious to what's going on. Behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. And he's just, okay, what are we doing? You know what I mean? Like, just the dopiest guy here. <laughs> it, sex is completely innocent to this guy. Um, but then in verse 10, and behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Um, so we have quite a few problems here. This is a woman who's married, but she's not seeking pleasure from her spouse. That's the first little word of warning there. Don't withdraw from your spouse. The, thing, and the second thing is that she's obviously hard-hearted because look how boldly she's doing it. The woman meets him in the street dressed as a prostitute. She didn't even like call from the door. She, was, she went out to the street. But then also look at verse 11. She's loud and wayward. She's not even trying to hide it from this guy. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I think about those girls who, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you've known one of them in your life. Like, you can hear them all the way across the store. They open their mouth, their mouth like this wide when they laugh. <laughs> yeah, they're like Chewbacca's, I swear. And you guys, you guys have met these people before. This is the kind of imagery I get in this verse. <laughs> Anyways, and they're intent on their purpose. Notice how she was just waiting for him to pass by. She was intent on her purpose. She, she stalked the prey and then she leapt. So now uh, let's let's keep mo let's keep moving. Um, it says here in verse uh, twelve. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's in verse fourteen. I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. There's two possibilities. The first possibility is that um, she is. Uh, do I have that written somewhere else? I I had that written somewhere else. So so let's just work look at the second one for now. Um, she was. Impure, either because of a period or because of she touched something dead or whatever. You you can go and read the law if you're curious for what makes you unclean. And she has waited the necessary time in order for her to be clean again, and she's offered her sacrifice uh, so that there's the idea of she she's ritually pure now, so she's free to have sex. Now, notice that this is heavily ironic because the offering was supposed to be for your connection with God. But to her, it's no more than lip service. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've done my sacrifice. I can go and cheat on my spouse now. Uh -huh. She completely missed the purpose of the sacrifice. Um, almost like people who celebrate Christmas now, but they don't do it to celebrate Jesus' birth and the fact that he came to earth for us. Right. They come for gifts, right? Mm -hmm. It's the exact same idea. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of materialistic Christmas, the exact same idea of, of what she's got going on here. Uh, you know, oh, I offered my sacrifice. Uh, are you sure you did? Because it sounds like you just slaughtered an animal. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong here. My tea's getting cold. Okay. But then also there's this idea that she slowly fools him into coming. Okay? Check this out. She starts out, you know, she meets him. She's dressed up, you know, pretty good looking. And so he's like, man, oh, man. And then she seizes on him, right? She grabs at him and she starts kissing at him, okay? With a bold face, she says these things, hey, I'm clean now. We can totally do this. Then she goes on to, uh, I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I've found you. The idea of, 
I was looking for you. What an idiot to think that he was that he was something special to her because he wasn't something special to her. If 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 her spouse isn't special to her, chances are you're not special to her. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, and it's the same thing for guys. So women, you th just substitute the girl for the guy, okay? Um, and then the, the the first option that I was telling you guys about, about the whole what's up with the offering is that she was part of what's called a fertility cult. In other words, she offered her sacrifice for fertility, and so now she's looking for a mate to have sex with for the sake of fertility. <laughs> Does that kind of make sense? Fertility cult, literally, it's exactly what it sounds like. Fertility cult. I mean, it's a really easy one. It's not, not hard to get... I mean, it's really easy to uh, understand there. Obviously, she wasn't really looking for him. Either way, if she was just somebody who was following the sacrifices, she was just looking for someone to have sex with. And if she was someone with fer the fertility cult, then he really wasn't anything special. She, she literally just needed sperm. That's all she needed. Doesn't care who it comes from. So either whether she's a Jew that just doesn't understand the offering, or whether she's part of the fertility cult, it's not looking good. Um, and so then uh, you, you notice that after after she says these things, may it builds him up that he's something real special, right? So let's go through the stages that that, that are used. She looks really good. Grabs him and starts kissing at him. That's gonna arouse his physical aspects. Uh, made it sound like sound like she was, you know, it's all good for us to do this. Uh, and then uh, I've come out to meet you. He's something special. In verse 16, I have spread ca my couch with coverings. This idea of setting the mood and making it real elaborate. This I have got this stuff from Egypt. This is Egyptian, <laughs> you know, like this real, you know, exotic stuff here. And it's like, eh, okay. But then she goes on. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. You know, ah, it's just carefree love. It's just all good, nothing bad. Let us delight ourselves with love. And then she goes to the real clincher. For my husband is not at home. Not This isn't something that's – it's okay for us to do this. She doesn't even care if it's right or wrong. She just goes to the thing of we can get away with it. Why shouldn't we do this thing? My husband's gone. He, he's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him, so he's going to be gone a long time. Okay, It was a huge bag of money. He's out of here. Uh, so the idea here is that he's going to be gone at least like two weeks, if not longer. Like he's going to be gone for a good amount of time. Um, at full at full moon, he will come home. So she's setting the mood. She's doing all these things, uh, and and pay attention to this because <laughs> right. <laughs> for those of you who didn't hear, I, I'm going to repeat that because that really was funny. She said um, he probably took the money so she wouldn't spend it. <laughs> uh, but anyways, people still use this same method, so you might want to pay attention to this. You know, uh, the focus is on the immediate pleasure, not love. And we're gonna have just a good time. No, no, no. There's no um, ropes. There, there's no commitment. We're just real easy, and it minimizes the consequences. They can get away with it while uh, while uh, focusing on that immediate pleasure. See, it's all good in the hood, and there's nowhere we're gonna get caught. Uh, so the, uh, the pill is bold, it's, it's exciting, it's safe, it's something, yes, this sounds so good! Except for, you know, if you was to listen to it. Because as, as Solomon goes on to say there, um, with much seductive speech she persuades him, this is something that happens over the course of time. With her, Even the fool isn't instantly persuaded into, into stupidity. See what I mean? Even the fool takes persuasion. See what I mean? So let that be a lesson to the wise, huh? All at once he follows her as an ox goes to slaughter, or as a stag is caught uh, is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. Now, I know Joe Flint knows this, but I don't know if you guys know this. The liver, especially at this time, is kind of like the symbolic for the seed of life. Okay, so for the liver to be pierced, it's basically the death blow. Okay, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. So, so we should notice there are a few things that this was something that built up. First off, he tempted himself. He went the wrong way. He went there at the wrong, wrong time of day, too. It was nighttime. And then he started he, – he, he, when she came up, he didn't turn away. He just let it happen. And then he listened to her wiles, her woman wiles. And uh, he was persuaded into this thing that was just uh, – see what I mean? It wasn't just something that he accidentally did it. It's something that – and here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you're paranoid about doing something like this, that's good. That's the starting point. 
that you need that, that that's good. But you need to take it past that. You need to make sure that you're not tempting yourself, and then equip yourself with the wisdom necessary to escape the temptations. So uh, it will morally destroy him. We see that in verse 23, and then uh, also notice what he says here because this is a powerful powerful statement. Foolish people miss the connection of the trap with death. Look at what he said here. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. The bird does not associate that the snare equals death. And look what he says here. The stag is not understanding that getting caught is going to lead to his, his, his liver getting shot. Okay? Uh, the uh, – what was the other image? The ox doesn't understand that following – into the slaughter is going to lead to slaughter. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? This idea that being led astray, not, not putting the dots together. This leads to death. That's what a foolish person does. Hey, adultery, this thing, it's pleasurable, it's fun, nobody will ever know. Not understanding that this is connected to death. They don't see the connecting things. See what I mean? And that's the idea here. Um, there was something else I was going to say, probably. It sounds like I would say something else. So, and then uh, Solomon ends in verse 24 through 27 with just um, just a quick w a words of warning. First off, resist her. Second off, avoid her. Third off, do what is right. Fourth off, you are not strong enough. Don't even try. You are not strong enough. And then fifth off, uh, your life and future are in the balance. We'll read those through, and you can kind of see these things. And now, as sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. So turn aside the idea of going towards. Do not stray into her past. For many a victim has she laid low. Many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Um, so, And here's just another side note. Don't be the first in the series of that person's mistakes. If somebody has it set in their heart to commit adultery, don't be their first mistake. Oh, I've never done this before. That doesn't make it any more right. <laughs> so just saying. Uh, and then the other thing that I really wanted to finish up, off, with, off with here... Uh, is that uh, adultery really does change our lives. It really does take more than it can ever give. Because when we cross the line to adultery, um, it really does – our our the way we think starts to change, the way we act starts to change, the way, the way we feel starts to change. And even if we're not married, we're just cheating on someone else who – cheating with someone else who is married, that's not any better. See what I mean? If you are married, there is no excuse for having sex with someone else. There is no excuse for thinking sexually about someone else. You can think sexually about your spouse all you want, but that's the only person you have the right to. And uh, if you are separated, can you have sex with someone else? No. The only way you can have sex with someone else is if you are divorced from your spouse and you marry someone else. So it's the only qualification for having sex with someone else besides your spouse. So with that being said, any questions? No. We're good? Awesome. Question of the week, you guys. Blam, what verses in chapters 1 through 9 are most important to you and why? You will be judged and graded. Not uh, as a test, but me personally, I will judge you and grade you. In rank of who I see is uh, the best answers and the worst. So prepare to be judged. <laughs> Just kidding. So what are we supposed to be saying the November 1st? The, the last Tuesday of the month. You haven't read chapter 9 yet. Huh? You haven't read chapter 9 yet. Well, hopefully, you guys have been reading in Proverbs. No? I have been. Well, there you go. Um, if not, I would encourage you throughout the next week to just go through chapters 1 through 9 and go through everything that we talked about, the 13 messages. And next week, we're going to look at chapters 8 uh, through 9 there. And so we'll look at the 12th and 13th message.